a holy grail, as in King Arthur, the Last Supper. It's a hard thing to live your life searching for something and never find it. He's probably the only true seeker we have. Then perhaps you do not know yourself. No boom today, boom tomorrow. There's always a boom tomorrow. Hello and welcome to Who Are You? The Babylon 5 Watchcast by a couple of internet strangers getting to know each other over the show Babylon 5. I am Laura. And I'm Jafer. And today I get to ask Jafer, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Do you know who I am? I love that stinger. (laughs) Anyways, Laura, I am a war gamer. This is a type of tabletop game that is, uh, you have lots of miniatures and you play a game with the miniatures and you do some kind of faux battle with them, right? I I know vaguely of this concept, but I don't know anything beyond what you just said, that there are miniatures and it's fighting and yeah. (laughs) So where this comes across a lot, in pop culture in like movies and things is you'll have like the guy who's really into like his civil war diorama (laughs) or something (laughs) it is the it is the logical evolution of that hobby of diorama making and it is just well now we make we play a game with our diorama what was general grant doing on the thermostat look don't these these are off limits no touch they are not toys. They're figurines. The diorama reference feels a little dated even. <laughs> it is. It is. We're the last generation that gets that, but go on. So yeah, I specifically, I play uh, Warhammer 40K, has made okay. famous by Henry Cavill recently, yeah. who's super I, into it. I have heard of this one. Yes. And it's funny because the army that he plays is like all Superman dudes that are like, super buff and wear this gold armor Mm. and it seems very appropriate Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways (laughs) and also like he uh in the game you field an army based off a number of points right different miniatures are worth different amounts of points and you add up to get like we're playing a thousand point game we're playing a two thousand point game whatever it is right Mm -hmm. and he he would have like 10 minis for a two thousand point game (laughs) and i specifically i play the tau which are communist alien space fish. Of course. Of course. Naturally. (laughs) And everyone, all the uh, other armies in the game are like super gritty and grim dark is the word that's thrown around. Oh, okay. And my guys are like all white. They kind of look like Power Rangers. Yeah. Like the mech suit that I'm building right now. I definitely feel very robot about it. The name Warhammer conjured up fantasy stuff and then you held up the robot and my brain was like doesn't go together (laughs) oh well there's those two oh okay okay i've got my table right behind me i can see it and that's that's where i build and paint and i've got a bunch of warhammer i've actually got a bunch of the very old stuff over there a friend's uncle passed recently and Mm -hmm. he was a nerd and a war gamer and he had when the hobby would just commonly referred to as a pile of shame (laughs) <laughs> which is a bunch of unbuilt, unpainted stuff that you can't use that you've spent money on for whatever reason. Mm, with, obviously yeah. with the intention of doing it someday. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And his pile of shame, I'm guessing, was purchased in the 90s based oh. off the age of all this stuff. Yeah. And I happen to see this friend and he's like, hey, I don't do this. Isn't my flavor of nerd. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm actually building that army right now. <laughs> um <laughs> and so he's all like it's going to a good home you'll use it you'll appreciate it yeah and so i got a bunch of old super old metal there i'm gonna go grab a couple to show yeah. you yeah okay and let me so, see the metal yeah like this is a chaos prince this is a demon oh wow um, that is re- got, that's like, gonna be so hard <laughs> all that and, wing detail like well actually the wing detail will probably not be that bad. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways of painting these things. And there's a lot of different paints to use. Okay. With mini painting, typically speaking, 
the miniature itself is cast, especially like these cast resin or metal dudes. Like he's a little guy on a knight with, oh, on horseback like with a spear and stuff. Typically, the detail is on the mini itself. I'm just going to text you some photos so you can appreciate the quality of these because there's very intricately detailed miniatures. And so the detail, instead of coming from the layers of paint, as one would expect, is in the mini itself. And so you do mm -hmm. what's called like a wash with a contrast paint or something, which is a very loose paint. And so you'll put like a base color over it and then you put like a wash paint on it that is a darker color that is very loose with the pigmentation. It's very watered down paint. Yeah. And what okay. that will do is that will sit in all the recesses and leave the high points alone. That makes sense. Yeah. And that's where you get all of your detail from. There's a bunch of like robot stuff in here, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't like individually paint the inside of all of these gears and all that stuff. I just did a wash coat over it and it went and took and laid like that to do all those things. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that is so, the way it's come out, it makes the miniature look like it's all different pieces. Yeah. Like and not so, like it was just one die or metal cast thing. Yeah. This robot suit dude, this guy was like 108 pieces altogether. Wow. Oh. So this is a hobby that I picked up at the start of 2020. Mm -hmm. You've only been doing it for two years? Yeah. And, and not, no, actually, it was 2021. I picked it up in 2021. I've been doing it for about a year. Impressive. And for those who this means something for, if you're a war gamer, I've got about four and a half K points of Tau. I've got one and a half K, maybe two K of Chaos Demons with all the new stuff. That's the old stuff that I just inherited. Mm -hmm. And then I've got about one K of all Mark Three Alpha Legion, which is all 30 K, not 40 K, which is a bunch of story stuff I won't get into. Okay. Okay. So when you said that Henry Cable has a 10 figure set that is for two like 2000 points. Yeah. Uh -huh. He'll have like 10 to 12 dudes for that probably with the army that he plays. Okay. So what is for a me, typical? Yeah. Well, it's different. So there's armies that are like, I could play a bunch of big robots. I could have two big robots and have that be 2000 points. Mm, okay. Or I could have 70 foot soldiers, 80 foot soldiers. And there are ones that are even less where some of these models are three or four points a piece for a dude. Okay. okay. And so, you know, do the math, you know, you're almost looking at a hundred of them. You can scale that way differently depending on what you want to do. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good to know. I've learned yeah. something today. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't play it. I've actually only played with my actual figures once. I've played online a lot just because of the pandemic. Right. And you've I, so, only been at it since pandemic. Yeah. But I had a handful of friends and they had played for years and there was like a, they put out boxes around Christmas every year of like, oh, this is, you know, get into it for kind of cheap. And I'm just all like, yeah. And <laughs> kind of cheap, by the way, is not kind of cheap. This is easily the most expensive hobby that I have. And swords are not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Guitars and microphones are not cheap either. I, you know, this is easily like, like uh, it was Codex Day for me two weeks ago, which is when I get my rule book for my army for the current rule set because mm -hmm. they put out new versions of the game every couple of years and your army gets your book. And so on like Codex Day, I spent 200 something dollars on a book and two minis. <laughs> I've gotten into 3D printing because it's significantly cheaper to make my own and print my own than it is to buy all the stuff that I want. Yeah. So that's been a fun little side thing. Like I have printed myself four miniatures on my 3d printer and like, but I've printed like three tanks and one big guy. Nice. And just from that, the MSRP of all of that stuff would have been $600. Uh, ouch. Yeah. And my 3D printer, the resin, and my wash and cure machine were like 250 mm. So It's a value. It's already paid for itself twice. Yeah, yeah. And I've still got plenty of life in that thing. 
Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Yeah, I like it because it lets me focus. I don't really care. Like the game is fun, and I always liked modeling when I was a kid. I had a couple like of the old enterprises and stuff. Yeah, you know, like those giant model kits and that kind of thing. And I wanted to do something like that again, but I couldn't justify having all of that stuff mm-hmm. around just taking up space. And so the fact that I can take these and play a game with them, even if that's just a theoretical value for the most part, uh-huh. <laughs> makes it more justifiable to me. Yeah. They, but they I really have like a painting purpose. and assembling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just like you spend a couple hours painting a miniature and it's very zen and it's very meditative and yeah yeah that's that's great that sounds like fun it's it's a lot of fun for sure well one of these days you are gonna have to take some king arthur inspiration and paint something in that sort of style so that's some knights yeah (laughs) yeah some some knights of the holy grail (laughs) i tried (laughs) Just like today's episode. Yeah, this is a fun episode because this is one of the like dozen episodes not written by JMS. Really? I didn't realize that. I'm glad you did some research there. Always. (laughs) (laughs) This episode is also much earlier in the production order than its air order, which I found interesting. This was the ninth episode they made. Yeah, my husband looked that one up too. And he actually read me the whole list of when things fell and then i promptly forgot it because that's how Mm -hmm. i do but this this is aired as season one episode 16 so Mm -hmm. it was a whole seven episodes later than it was originally produced Mm -hmm. we open up on a ship coming in with passengers the starliner von braun and then we immediately cut to sinclair and garibaldi eating breakfast in the marketplace Mm -hmm. and i already asked you to scrub to 33 seconds i've got it up (laughs) Sinclair has like four pounds of fruit on his plate. He really does. And that thing in the middle could be like, because, you know, the the definition on this isn't the best. It could be like, you know, jello with fruit. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> it is a really odd choice for breakfast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're going to eat all of that and you're going to be hungry two hours later, my dude. I'm assuming it's breakfast. I don't know why. Do they? I don't even know if they say it's early in the morning. But but... I don't. I don't know. It, um, it feels like breakfast to me. Sinclair does heckle Garibaldi about how fast he's eating. And then Garibaldi remarks that he has seen Sinclair eat. And he asks him if he's heard of the Doppler effect. And <laughs> is this a joke about how loud he eats? Is that what this is? I'm guessing it has to be. Yeah. Which rude, rude to call that out. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then Delenn and Lanier are walking by. We know Delenn is in this episode because it was produced early. Oh, yeah. So we've mixed it up to make it seem like she didn't take a big break. (laughs) Yeah. That's why we put this where we did. Yeah. Okay, Mm -hmm. got it. And they're just like, yo, why aren't you at the docking bay in your dress uniforms right now? He's just like, uh, what? (laughs) It's like someone's coming in and they have no idea what's going on. Who's coming? And Sinclair tells Garibaldi to get the honor guard ready. And they're just like, we don't know what's going on. Yeah. It's interesting that Delenn knows, but no mm-hmm. one has informed the commander. And it's an Earth starship that's coming in. So, Yep. From there, we move to Down Below. And we meet Jinxo. Hi, I'm Elfo. <laughs> and it was revealed that he worked on the station as it was being built. And that he's in considerable debt. Mm-hmm. And his debt collector here is demanding 100,000 credits. This is absurd money. Like, if you think about the values of money that have been thrown around and down below before, this is insane. Mm, Good point. This is like the Dr. Evil equivalent of asking for $100 trillion. Didn't we pay somebody off for just like 5,000 or maybe it was 15,000 credits? No, yeah, no, the Knights bought someone off for 5K. Yeah. yeah. So, Someone had accrued substantial gambling debt to the point where it was illegal for him to have that much gambling debt. And it was like 2,000 credits. Yeah. So, Jinxo, what has he, what has he gotten himself into, do you think? <laughs> I, it's insane. 
anyways, uh, this creditor isn't happy, and he uh, he kills someone with Kosh and a Centauri dick. Yeah, that he brought it back immediately. That's a penis. It's the penis. <laughs> it's it's the penis. <laughs> and it's not even attempting to hide that fact. Yeah, I was going to say, I really hope these two didn't air side by side, but you have, I think, confirmed for us that Grail did not air side by side with. No, this this order is different. This yeah. is like, I think, the DVD order or something, mm -hmm. um, which you is different than the air order together. and the production order. No, you can't you can't back to back this in streaming times. Like, mm -hmm. literally have the Centauri dick puppet, and then 15 minutes later, you've got this thing. Yeah, like, even in, you know, a week apart watch in the 90s, everyone still would have caught this. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. yeah, so the lady that's killed, she's Miriam Running Deer, and um, crime boss, I don't know exactly what he is, like, yeah, he's, he's the bad guy today, Deuce is his name, says that she was going to testify against him in court mm -hmm. later. So we also have court back to back in these two episodes. And I think, I don't know. I don't remember ever seeing court ever again, but I didn't really remember this episode either, by the way, I'm just going to throw yeah. that out there. That's fair. It's kind of, it's an interesting, I mean, I think that it's good for it to air earlier because yes. it adds and furthers the mystery of Babylon four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Which the Babylon 4 episode is coming up here. Mm -hmm. Spoilers, there's a Babylon 4 episode. <laughs> That's in a couple of episodes now. And so for this to have gone earlier in the order makes a lot more sense, too, to kind of like they brought it up in the pilot. I think they've brought it up once since then and just <laughs> like keep laying those seeds for something yeah. weird happened with Babylon 4. Yep, we're going to keep doing that. But first we go to the courtroom. Mm -hmm. We get Ombuds Wellington again, and he's dealing with a civil suit between a human and a Vri, they're called. Mm -hmm. And this is what you were thinking of in last episode. Yes, but I <laughs> edited that out. Oh, okay. Okay. So <laughs> we had a moment last episode off pod where Jafar yeah. says, there's going to be a fun episode or a fun moment later with this guy. And, and it was literally the next episode and I realized. Yeah. <laughs> So this human has examined the Vri archives and he could prove that his grandfather was abducted by the Vri's grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wants damages because of yep. course that's, yeah, that's what we know, do, right? That's how we roll. I, I really just want to say this must have been a really fun day for that actor. Like yes. to go in and just ham that up. What a lucky guy. <laughs> <laughs> And then Ombuds Wellington complains that Ombuds Zimmerman never gets these cases. <laughs> and we all have a good laugh. See, Ombuds Wellington here is Jim Norton. Okay. Who's in all kinds of stuff. He's one of those BBC actors who's in everything. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. He's got one of those faces. Yeah. I mean, he was in Harry Potter. Was he? He was. Who was he in he, Harry Potter? He was no one of consequence. He was oh. in Chamber of Secrets as Mr. Mason. Oh, okay. Darn. <laughs> he played Albert Einstein in Next Gen. Oh, okay. But he's been uh, all over the place. Well, I didn't recognize Ombuds Wellington, but uh, when we get over to Space TSA here next, I did oh, yeah. recognize all this Gajic, Gajic. Gajic. Yeah, I recognized him because he's David Warner. David and, fucking Warner. And he is, it, see, where I know him from my childhood, at least, is mm -hmm. he is in what I think is one of the best versions of A Christmas Carol. He's in The Christmas Carol that has George C. Scott as Scrooge. And he okay. is Bob Cratchit. So oh, that's I, fun. He comes on screen and I go, it's Bob Cratchit. <laughs> <laughs> He's, He's the great. MCP in Tron. He's oh, been like okay. a dozen Doctor Who characters. He's Chancellor Gorkhan and Gol Madred in Star Trek in <gasps> the TOS movies and then TNG. Nice. Uh, he's the voice of Ra's al Ghul in the DC animated series from the 90s, the Batman and the mm -hmm. Superman. He's got a good uh, voice, yeah. yeah. He's the lobe and Freakazoid. 
<laughs> he was in Time Bandits. He was in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He was in Titanic. He was in The Omen. He was in The Mouth of Madness. Wow. Uh, he's Jack the Ripper in Time After Time, which, t- by the way, Time After Time, low key banger of a movie, if you're not familiar. I'm not. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> it, it's 80s Tastic Sci Fi where H.G. Wells builds his time machine, uh-huh. goes back in time and tries to track down Jack the Ripper and Jack the Ripper and him accidentally travel to the eighties. Oh boy. Yep. <laughs> time after time. It is just as ridiculous as it sounds. It's a There's lot of our fun. next season break. No, no, we need to watch sh- movies with the actors in them, but yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know who, I don't even remember who else is in time after time to be perfectly we'll, honest. We'll it's been a out. while. We'll look into it. Yeah, but um, we get we get David Warder coming off the ship. Yep. Uh, to meet excited Dylan and Lanier, and Sinclair formally welcomes him aboard, but he uh, starts kind of low key cracking up inside when yeah. uh, Gajic explains that he's there for the Holy Grail. <laughs> yeah, Garibaldi. The camera cuts to him, and he actively eye rolls. I know. I was like, "That's so rude, man." Yeah. <laughs> Yep, there's no place left on Earth to look, so they look outward. Yeah, and he he didn't inform the Earth Force Command because he figured it was just a matter for the ambassadors, and he was probably a little embarrassed. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's funny that Garibaldi rolls his eyes so obviously as he does, and Sinclair's, you know, stifling his laughs because our cast seems to have forgotten that they've seen a machine that heals life by taking life energy from someone. Yeah. They met a lady who had a universal cure for aging and mm-hmm. a guy who steals souls, but somehow one old dude looking for the Holy Grail is the crazy one. Yep. <laughs> and this is, this is, dear listener, if this is your first time watching Babylon 5, oh, just you wait. <laughs> <laughs> it, there is, there is some characters in this show that <laughs> you will not believe are in this show <laughs> i will leave it at that <laughs> but wait there's more delenn catches up with sinclair after this because she didn't feel the expected reverence for their guest mm-hmm. he explains that this is a children's tale there's no truth in it and delenn expresses <laughs> regret for he's a holy man a true seeker it doesn't matter if the grail exists for the journey is the perfection of his soul the salvation of his race. He has never wavered or lost his faith. Mm-hmm. Sinclair notes he is likely the only human true seeker. And Delenn goes, Yeah, uh, mm. maybe, maybe you, buddy. Eh. <laughs> elbow, elbow. <laughs> so Aldous needs to get some money out of the Bitcoin machine. Yeah. Uh, and while he's at the, over there, he has his pocket picked by Jinxo. Jinxo is desperate to raise these hundred thousand credits that he's got to get somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, picks his pocket but garibaldi was showing all this the bitcoin machine so he's right there Mm -hmm. he places jinxo under arrest and insists that all this accompanied them to the courtroom and apparently we just go straight from arrest to judgment on babylon 5 like we're just dragging (laughs) everybody involved to the ombuds right now (laughs) i mean it's garibaldi style yeah totally so jinxo is going to be brought before the ombuds but before that, Franklin uh, gets the Centauri Dick victim in MedLab. Mm-hmm. They've been brain wiped, but it notes that it was something other than a machine. Yeah. So, and this is apparently number three, I think they say. This is mm-hmm. another brain wipe victim. And that's, this made me ask all qu- kinds of questions. like Ask away. Yeah. So we, th- we saw, was this the last episode that we just had that we saw? Mind wipe? Brain wipe? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it involved so. Talia, and they had to have some equipment, but Franklin says something like, no machine could do this. Yeah. Whatever this was, it was something worse than the machine mm-hmm. they used to wipe people. Garibaldi gets real up on this and uh-huh. uh, wants to just clear out all the crime. Just give me the permission to just clear out down below. Yeah. And so like... They're down on their luck immigrants who can't afford a ride home and are just trying to survive. What are you going to do? Airlock them? Yes. Yeah. Garibaldi wants to airlock the immigrants. He says, don't tempt me. And it's like, okay. like You're going to build a wall around the station too, bro? 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, exactly. It's like, you know, these are these are all criminals to him and their lives have no value, I guess. And they should all just mm -hmm. be sent into space because they've committed some sort of crime. And we established in the last episode that Earth doesn't want their criminals, even the murderer. You know, we're not going to bring him back and incarcerate yeah. him. And they don't have a huge prison. So literally, that's his only option. And he's like, yeah, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with mass murder. I will I will commit that in the name of the state. Sure. I don't know how hey. I feel about Garibaldi. <laughs> I do. Anyways, Sinclair wants Franklin to investigate the mine wipes further so they can pin it on Deuce since uh, she was going to testify today. We cut to the okay. court and Jinxo is there for petty and incompetent theft for the third time. <laughs> <laughs> it's noted he's a very skilled construction worker who helped build all five of the Babylon stations. His trade is in high demand, so he doesn't need to be stealing. The judge is just going to pay for his ticket off the station, and he's not allowed back for five years. Like, look, I will pay for your ticket and get you somewhere where you can be a productive member of society because you're clearly capable of holding a job. Yeah. I mean, but no one's exactly examined his mental health. So that aside, like, that doesn't sound terrible to me. Like, the court being like, here's some yeah. this. We're going to put you in a better spot to use your skills. And yeah, it sounds like some real good use of civic funds through social work mm -hmm. yeah. instead of needlessly punishing someone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They should really throw in a mental health evaluation, though, because he starts they paranoid. Should you know freaking out he's he's paranoid he's insisting he cannot leave the station for any reason because something bad will happen to it just like all the others mm -hmm. so but the babylon station through babylon 4 aldis uh, is there yeah uh, in the crowd sees this and just is like hey judge can we talk <laughs> real quick <laughs> and assumes remedial custody of jinxo yeah Wellington agrees to this. Why? <laughs> I don't understand. I mean, he's a man of some gravitas. It is David Warner. <laughs> yeah, he'd be very convincing, wouldn't he? We'll have to. I mean, and low key, dude's probably loaded. We find out later, you know, his previous career and everything, and that, mm. you know, he's the last of his order. They say that before this point, too. You know, <laughs> there's probably some accrued wealth. So he could probably just be like, look, I'm rich. I'm going to give this guy a job. And he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I buy it's, that. Yeah. You know how I imagine that conversation taking place after this Deuce's case comes up and gets dismissed for a lack of evidence. I wonder why we do that. Like, you know, if, if our one witness has disappeared, well, she hasn't disappeared. She's been bodily harmed in under suspicious circumstances. Why would you just dismiss the whole case? <laughs> like, can't you uh, put a pin in it for a second? <laughs> right. It seems a bit bizarre to me. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to point out, because we talked about that Jinxo worked on all five of the Babylon stations. Mm -hmm. That he, He's kind of a young dude, right? So that made me go, wait, is he old enough to have worked on all the Babylon stations? Because I don't know off the top of my head the years that... Uh, they were built in. So I looked it up mm -hmm. and it looks like you did research. I, I did a research. Look at me. Uh, I looked it up and it someone looks just like... won. Who are you? Bingo. <laughs> uh, the five Babylon stations were built over eight years in succession. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that knowing what I know about government projects and how long those take, I call bullshit on this. <laughs> There's no way we built five huge space stations in well they didn't they didn't get most of them to near completion that's true but even you know the the accidents happening in between yeah you you wouldn't just start building a new station right away like well they actually talk about this so babylon's one and two were sabotaged in very early construction mm, right okay. like jinxo specifically the type of construction work that he does is like very early structural stuff. He's like building the center of the station, like the thing that all other things are built off of because he finished the job on Babylon one very early left. It blew up, finished the job on Babylon two left early. It blew up. 
Babylon 3, he says his job was done early. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And so he stuck around for a little bit. And, you know, when he took his vacation, it blew up. One of them wasn't even done with his job. He took vacation, right? Right. right. Babylon 3, then he stuck around for a bit and was all like, okay, my part of it's done. And then it blew up. Babylon 4 is the one he stuck around on well past his part of construction. He like makes a point of being like, I was on the station for a while after my job was done. (laughs) So, I mean, there's a big gap of time. And also, I don't know if it's here or somewhere else. And I read it in a wiki, but they used chunks of Babylon's one, two, and three. I did see that too. Yeah. That they just repurpose some stuff yeah because babylon's one two three and four were all effectively the same design of station yeah and a chunks of all of them made it into babylon four before that one vanished i don't know i still don't think you can get any government project done this fast (laughs) oh well yeah i mean that's fair (laughs) yeah but it's a nice idea yeah it's not like they completely built four space stations in eight years though yeah Eldis and Jinxo talk while leaving the courtroom. He wants to know why he would help him. And Jinxo explains the Babylon curse. When he leaves, it explodes or vanishes or something. He left for vacay. They blew up. He stayed on before he started to finish, thinking that would relieve the curse. And he, as soon as he left on a shuttle, it vanished. And so when B5 started, he came and he never left. Aldous notes he has the wrong nickname. He should be called Lucky since nothing bad happens when he's around. Mm, that's really nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Perspective is important. Jinxo warns him that he is in debt to the wrong people and Deuce is going to come for him soon. So really mm-hmm. all this should just get away and stay away because he's in trouble. After this, we get a bit in Sinclair's office about the Nakaline Feeder, an alien predatory life form from Centauri space that can brain wipe its victims in a similar manner to what's been happening. Uh-huh. It's so gotta he... be from Centauri space. <laughs> Wonder <Huh>. why. <laughs> we need to uh, cover for the fact that this is the Centauri penis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Sinclair goes to find Malari. He's in the casino. Of course. And Londo has heard of the Nakaline feeder, he says. And then he becomes uncharacteristically terrified at the prospect of one of them being on the station. Yeah, the first word out of his mouth is hideous creatures. Yeah. Which, admittedly, if I saw a creature that could wipe brains with something that looked like my penis, I would probably feel the same way. The only good one is a dead one. Uh, <laughs> that line has some very specific oh. weight behind it that made me cringe. Yeah. Um, uh, Lando's like, but this is all hypothetical, right? <laughs> right? And then he steals a drink and runs away to lock himself up. Uh-huh. It says, Veer will send over anything you need. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good, Lando. Such a good scene. All this meets with Dylan and Lanier to talk about the Grail. They mm-hmm. don't know of it. They're very gracious, but they promise that the Mimbari will keep an eye out for it and bring it to him if they ever find it. Jinxo is surprised by their kindness, and Lanier explains that there are two casts of Mimbari, which I just want to say, not true, right? There's I've a third got a one. whole rant in my notes about this. Okay, you want to <laughs> you want to do your rant now? Yeah, he <laughs> forgets the worker cast. Yeah. Again. Mm, he didn't watch the union episode. He did not watch the unionization episode. It's a fucking problem, <laughs> you know? And I think it's interesting that even like we have this unionization episode a couple episodes ago, right? Mm-hmm. And we see that it's a problem for the human cultures. Mm-hmm. And then for the Mimbari, just be like, oh, well, there's only two types of people, religious and warrior. When the majority of their society is the worker caste. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have some serious worker issues in this universe, don't we? Because we also had, we established earlier that the Centauri still have slavery. Yeah. Or they are close enough to slavery that people can be sold into it. I wonder how much of this is the lack of robots. (laughs) If we had robots, we wouldn't have so much slaves. Yeah, well, yeah, you'd have robot slaves. Yeah, which is a whole other ethical thing. Yeah, well, I mean, yes. For sure, especially if they're sentient, that's 
fucking terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, Mr. Google, listening to everything we say on the internet, you know how I feel about robot sentience and slavery. <laughs> I feel like uh, we're treading into Star Trek Picard territory a little bit. With we that. are. Yeah. I'm wondering if that's a path the reboot goes. Mm, it would be very timely. It would be. And it would, I mean, that'd be an update that could be made for sure. Yeah. But I still hope we have another Union episode. There, it, well, there kind of is. Uh, there's a whole the Mimbari worker cast is not always forgotten. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Oh, I, I meant in the reboot have a, another union oh, episode. Yes. But yes, I, I am with you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's he totally forgets about the worker cast, and he says that the warrior cast would not understand, and so the religious cast will simply not tell them, which I thought yep. was a whole other pickle <laughs> quandary. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Aldous asks Delenn what happens when the two sides of their culture agrees and she's like, it's terrible and let's hope it doesn't happen again while we're alive. <laughs> I, is she referencing the Minbari War? Yeah, is she's that... referencing the Earth Minbari yeah. War. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. We go back to Down Below and Deuce is meeting with his Kosh, quote, quote, mm -hmm. who has a very realistic Kosh outfit. It's very convincing. Yes, um, but not a very kosh voice no <laughs> and even less a kosh word choice mm -hmm. kosh says three words in this episode yeah. right like okay. actual yeah. kosh when kosh speaks it's very short this is kind of long-winded almost comparatively mm. okay i thought that yeah. was interesting i also thought it was interesting that these creatures are sentient and I carry a conversation and thought it was interesting that they spoke english yeah. So <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> this quasi sentient being from Centauri space has somehow adapted to English. Maybe we say quasi sentient, but um I think they're fully sentient. Yeah. It might be like a mind flayer thing where it eats the brain and gets the knowledge. Mm. Yeah. Could be. We don't get enough it about English. it. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, but Deuce orders the his cronies should get Jinxo and Wellington and he will feed this creature. Mm -hmm. They confirm it's a feeder with Franklin based off the information they get from the Centauri. And they mm -hmm. start digging through paperwork to try and find who and how it was brought aboard. Yeah. Uh, we then get uh, cut to Lando screaming to put the quarantine back on Talos 4 uh, while Aldis patiently is waiting for his scheduled meeting. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun scene transition. Yeah. Um, yeah. He says to Aldous that what he's asking for is going to be time consuming and expensive. But Veer hops in and says, oh, no, I already did it. <laughs> <laughs> Lando is livid. The Republic is going to efficient itself into extinction. <laughs> <laughs> well, would that be so bad? Anyway, so no. Lando is very mad at Veer that he charged them nothing and he did it so quickly. Jinxo and Aldous leave and Jinxo asks, what would you do with the grail if you found it? And how did he get started on this quest? Mm -hmm. And so Aldous explains that he used to be an accountant. He had a wife and kids until a tragic accident on Mars during a vacation. He went back to work, but the numbers didn't add up anymore. And he was consumed by his grief until he met a dying man who had also been seeking the grail. I really liked the words that he said here and the way he delivered them was just really yeah. precious and touching. He said that the man told him he was a man of infinite promise and goodness. And upon his death, Aldous took up the quest as his own. And I was just, mm -hmm. I, if, even though I, I'm going to say on a whole, I don't like this episode. I'm just going to go spoil spoiler town on that for a mm -hmm. second. Um, but I really liked this scene and I really liked the description of grief because, you know, I've been doing a little bit of that myself lately. Mm -hmm. And I did have that moment in this last month where I walked back into work as an accountant and was like, why am I here? Like, what? Yeah. Why does the, nothing, none of this matters? Like, I didn't want to be there. So I just really liked David Warner's delivery here and his, his monologue, I guess. It was very mm -hmm. appropriate and it spoke to me. After this, 
the judge gets grabbed. Mm-hmm. And uh, all this and Thomas go to see Kosh, actual Kosh. Yeah. Which freaks uh, <laughs> Thomas out and he runs and hides. Yeah. He starts frantically yelling to all this that Kosh is going to eat his brain. Yeah. <laughs> Very embarrassing for Aldous, but he mm-hmm. doesn't seem too embarrassed. Aldous goes to find him when he runs and gets grabbed by Deuce's gang as well. Yeah. Station leadership is on the trail while Deuce is going to mind wipe everybody. <laughs> Sinclair yeah. finds Thomas and is going to take him and security to Deuce. Aldous engages with the feeder who doesn't mind wipe him. Yeah, and, like, it's really the weird. Suit. Yeah. And we get Babylon 5's first fully CGI alien in this scene. Yeah, we do. And you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> I watched this on the TV. Didn't look good. Yeah. Um, and then when I did, you know, I, I do a little notes watch after we watch it for the first time. Uh, mm-hmm. I had that up on my phone and I was like, oh, it looks okay here on my tiny little <laughs> phone screen. <laughs> it's a, such a sadness that you think you've seen a film on your fucking telephone. Get real. Anyways, uh, we get this baby mind flare. Security gets there and busts up the scene. Thomas saves the judge's life. Elda saves Thomas. Sinclair mm-hmm. and security just start blasting. Yeah, I think one of Deuce's men gets eaten in here too. Like, the, mind yeah. eating. Yeah. Thomas takes over for Aldous, who got got. And uh, Aldous gives Thomas everything and dies. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a very unceremonious death. Come closer. You must know something about the prophecy. I know, I'm doing my best, but I, I don't, I don't... The prophecy. I made it up. <sighs> well, we get a nice monologue, I guess. Mm-hmm. And he, I don't remember if it was here or it was a little earlier, but he also tells Jigso that he is a, a man of infinite promise and goodness. And I'm like, yes. aw, that's very sweet. Thank you. But yeah, David Warner does a good death scene. Later, Sinclair goes to see real Kosh. He says that they confiscated a fake encounter suit, but I don't think he really dresses how they made it or anything, because I was very curious about that since it was so realistic. Mm -hmm. And Kosh is happy that people find him mysterious and uncomfortable. Yeah. Asshole. (laughs) Yes. Good. (laughs) Delenn and Sinclair meet to see Thomas off on his journey. Delenn notes Aldous found what he was looking for, a reason. Mm -hmm. Thomas leaves and corrects Garibaldi. The curse is over. When he's like, hey, Jinxo, he's like, I'm Thomas now, bye. Yeah, take your name back, sir. We get a little bit with Londo nervously leaving his quarters after this. (laughs) The monster is dead. Uh, Who then fucks with the Centauri delegation on the level of that time. Sinclair told Jakar he was tagged. Oh, for no yeah. reason. It's just I, like mm, this is similar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It felt a lot like that scene where they fucked with Jakar, where he's just all like, "I put a thing in you. It's mm-hmm. super small. They'll never find it." That's what she said. Don't you dare. If it gets too quiet, then something's nearby. Yeah. Yeah. Nice Where's touch. That? Nice touch. We go back to CNC, and Ivanova, Sinclair, and Garibaldi are watching Jinxo shuttle leave. Yep. They are holding their breath and counting the seconds till it enters the jump gate and jumps away. And then mm-hmm. nothing no boom. explodes. No boom. No boom today. Tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Maybe boom. <laughs> <laughs> boom eventually. Yeah. Someday. <laughs> and scene. Yep. So. What'd you think? of? Well, you already said you didn't like this one. I think because I have watched ahead a few episodes. And Mm -hmm. I will say this, and I'll probably mention it again in the next episode, but we've hit a a pocket where I don't remember them. This one, the next one, and the one after that, at least in HBO Max order. I don't remember these at all. I like remembered David Warner's appearance, but I didn't remember anything else about the episode. So it's sort of like watching them fresh almost. I think this one is down there in Babylon 2 territory for me. I mean, we get good story and stuff, but I was very distracted. If it wasn't for David Warner acting the shit out of this episode, this would be (laughs) a Babylon one for me. Okay, because I I just, 
Jinxo had the the dumbest look on his face the whole time. He did. I was like, the the. Are we sure we don't want to send for a psyche valve or something? Maybe things were too rushed for me or something, but yeah, yeah, this was down there in the two territory. And I know that we're going to have really good coming up in the next, you know, once we get past the ones I don't rem- didn't remember, I feel like we get mm-hmm. some really good stuff. Yeah. I just didn't feel great about this one. So are you in Babylon two territory as well? I'm going to put this at one and a half. Oh, the decimals are back. <laughs> the decimals never left. <laughs> um, the decimals make good memes, so we got to keep it up. I got to I gotta feed the meme machine somehow. Yeah, I, uh, this is a one and a half for me. And to mm-hmm. be perfectly honest, 1.25 of that goes straight to David Warner. Yeah. I mean... The other 0.25 is to Ivana for, for no boom today, right? Yeah. <laughs> or no boom tomorrow. Boom tomorrow. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. It was this it was just a boring episode. Like yeah. there was I mean that fun bit with the alien and the granddad. There were some fun bits. There was a couple of fun moments, but overall they did not redeem the episode to me. It was mm-hmm. very clearly not written by JMS. You definitely feel the pacing is very different than the rest of the series. Uh-huh. It just feels a little off the entire time. And I think that's why. I wish that David Warner had gotten a better episode yeah. to do. But he did he did the best he could with what he had, for sure. Mm-hmm. I think I remember reading something about how they wanted to get him back for more. I would too. It just didn't work out. Mm-hmm. They wanted him to come back as aliens. Throw him in some loaf. Well, it's a shame. All right. Well, next week we've got season one, episode 17, Eyes. Mm -hmm. Two high-ranking Earth Force security officers arrive on B5 to evaluate the loyalty of Sinclair and his commanding officers. This is the one that's got Jeffrey Combs, right? Yes, it is. Cool. I'm glad I remember this episode. I did not. I I knew that Jeffrey Combs made an appearance in Babylon 5, but I had Baby no Jeffrey idea where Jeffrey Combs. It was. You're going to yeah. pinch his cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> he is so young. This He's is before so young. the D Space Nine. I mean. Yeah. And I mean, he looks great. He looks great. The The voice is what gives him oh, yeah. away. Well, yeah, his voice is so. Yeah. <sighs> the man is an icon. He really is. He's a sci-fi treasure. For sure. All right. Thank you, as always, to Jeremy Siegel for composing and giving us our lovely theme music. We really appreciate it. Thank you to Angry Deck Time Machine on Instagram for our podcast artwork. And you can engage with us on the Facebook and you can send us an email to whoareub 5 at gmail.com and we'll read it in our next mailbag segment. Yeah. And thank you, listener, for sticking through this one with us. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I hope you got more laughs out of our episode than the two the episode itself gave you. Yeah. <laughs> See you next week. See you next week. See you next week.